Welcome to the Swain Sinus Show, a physician and patient discussion on how to better manage and treat mild to serious sinus issues and conditions. From diagnosis, treatment, home remedies, and surgery, Stacy and Dr. Swain will talk about improving your quality of life, breathing easier, and feeling better. Let's take control over our sinuses and allergies so they don't control us. Well, welcome to episode two of season two. It's good to see you again, Dr. Swain. Thanks, Stacey. I'm glad to be here. What are we going to talk about today? You know, I thought we would talk a little bit about kids, pediatrics. Great. And some of the sinus issues that they have and some of the ear, nose, and throat issues that they have as well. I think so many times in families, you know, uh, the kids are, are sick and then the whole family gets sick, kind of goes through the whole house. Right. Uh, so I thought we'd spend a few minutes talking about children and some of their issues. You do see children. Let's just start with a simple question. Yes, uh, of all ages. Okay. So is there a lower age that you would not see or do you, you'll see them? I see them at all ages. I've seen them from, from a few days old to, uh, to adulthood. Wow. A few days old. Uh, yeah. <laughs> They're little. They're small. <laughs> Those sinus issues start from the beginning, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, this was not a sinus problem, but uh, yeah, you can, you know, kids have sinus issues as well. So let's talk about what makes working with children uh, a little challenging. You know, we were talking before the show, and I think the first thing is, is that kids are fun, but kids are hard. You know, depending on, on how big they are, there's always a matter of trust. Um, the thing that kids universally just don't like is is to be held down. Mm. You can, you know, if they're sitting on mom's lap, everything's good. As soon as you try to lay them down to look at their ear, look in their their nose, and they get held down, they don't like that. So if you can talk to the child, depending on how the child is, you try to establish some type of rapport. And of course, the number one thing that you fear when you get to the doctor when you're a kid is getting a shot. Right. The first conversation is, you are not going to get a shot. We're going to give you some suckers. We're going to give you a lollipop. We're going to give you stickers. We try to make it a fun experience um, in a situation where a lot of times they're sick and it's not so fun. Right. They're already not feeling well. So to come to the doctor and think they're going to get poked and prodded and stuck, it's good to be able to allay some of those fears from the beginning. Right. Especially when when they're sick and, um, you know, their nose is congested. Uh, A lot of times, you know, parents are bringing their child in and saying, hey, you know, my child's got recurrent ear infections or... Um, my child has is snoring and mouth breathing. My child is can't hear. So there are a lot of I mean, ear, nose, and throat encompasses a lot of, a lot of material, and so kids can have all kinds of complaints, right? Or kids problems. certainly have are, are known for getting ear infections and tubes and such. So maybe tell us what are the you know most common things that you see with children? Certainly, ear infections. I, I think that's uh, probably number one. Closely behind it, number two, or or sinus infections. Number three would be Snoring and mouth breathing. Can't breathe through their nose. And a lot of times, not surprisingly, all those things are related. There are times when kids will just have an ear infection. But when you really start asking and examining the child and talking to mom, most of the time mom, sometimes dad, uh, dads will be there as well. You know, they'll say they have a lot of ear infections. Yeah, they're snoring. Yeah, they're mouth breathing. My child has a green runny nose. My child's, you know, kind of got the daycare-itis, and that's in parentheses, where we're snotty, it seems like, mm-hmm. all year long. Mm-hmm. You know, we were. When I was reading an article not too long ago that mentioned and reviewed the fact that children typically will have between six to twelve upper respiratory tract infections a year. Wow! And you know, depending That's on every the month. Yeah, it's almost one a month. Um, so again, we're talking about expectations. It's okay. Well, you know, if you have a small child and they're in daycare, they're going to get sick. I think everybody kind of is, ex- understands that. Uh, but when they're not getting better, or when it's been going on for a long time, you know, it's one of the things we, we talk about with families. You know, if this is a repetitive process, when we mentioned the show about the frequency mm-hmm. of infections, I think that's a key thing to mention. So that would be a question I would have is so many parents, obviously children have a pediatrician, so they visit the pediatrician often. At what point do they need to, to come to you, an otolaryngologist, a specialist, you know, an ENT doctor? Well... Fortunately, we have very close relationship with the pediatricians. The answer is we work very closely with them. Their input is really vital to how we approach this. It just depends on the frequency of the infection more than anything else. The, the pediatricians a lot of times will look and say, look, I've seen your child you know, four, five, six times. If they've been on all those antibiotics, they'll send them uh, for us to take a look at and kind of evaluate them. And a lot of times they send the child and put the child in a box, and by the time we see them, they're clear. Mm. I think it's easier to make a decision about whether or not some, a child or someone needs surgery if they have a history of, you know, I'm sick all the time. They've been on all these antibiotics. You see them. They're still sick. 
then it's more of cut and dry in terms of, okay, this child is just not getting better with all of the medication. Kids are hard. And so sometimes what happens is they're sick, they're better. They're sick, they're better. And you see them back and you look and you're like, you've got this big, strong history of, my gosh, these children have been on all these antibiotics. And you get in and to see them and they're clear. And well, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of it depends on the time of year. But if I see a child who's had a history of ear infections and has had a large number of ear infections, six, seven ear infections, and they're clear, then you start talking to mom, okay, you're a candidate to do something if we're talking about ear tubes, like for example. Like a surgical solution. Yeah. We put those tubes in because we know if you've had seven infections in a year and you're under five years of age, you're probably going to still have some more ear infections. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if you see them and they're five or six years of age and their ear is clear and they don't have any hearing loss, a lot of times you don't have to operate on those kids. It's a matter of talking to mom and dad going, okay, look, you know, hang in there. You're doing the right stuff. It's just a question of getting the child a little bit older and hopefully you can avoid an operation. So Dr. Swain, a lot of my parent friends talk about their children getting tubes in their ears. Can you talk a little bit about what tubes are, what it means, at what age do you consider tubes? And I've also had friends who, who've had to have tubes replaced. Is that a common thing? Sure. Well, the first question would be, what is a tube and why do we put it in? And that's a hard thing to demonstrate on a talk <laughs> when we're, on a, we're on a, uh, in a studio and I can't draw. But if you can imagine, you know, the ear, I guess people don't really know how it's all connected, but the ear is a cavity. And the cavity uh, is connected to the back of your nose. And there's a tube, the eustachian tube, that connects the two. And so in children and in some adults, because we put tubes in people of all ages, that tube a lot of times doesn't work well Mm. for whatever reason, whether it's recurrent infection or allergies or obstruction. And so when that tube doesn't work well, your ear is more susceptible to being stopped up and to getting your infection. And so by putting a little hole in the eardrum and putting a small little tube in the eardrum, that acts like a safety valve, for lack mm-hmm. of a better word. Mm-hmm. And so it allows air to bypass the eustachian tube and to get in behind the eardrum into the middle ear. And by doing that, when someone gets sick, if a child gets sick and they've got a tube in their ear, their nose may get congested, but that to, that won't result in them getting an ear infection if the middle ear is well ventilated. Mm. Now, sometimes it gets to be a little more complicated than that. There are a lot of reasons why we can put tubes in, in people's ears. But if you think about most adults have been on an airplane or been in an elevator that's gone up in the building and their ears mm-hmm. pop because mm-hmm. they feel pressure and their ears pop. Well, that's your eustachian tube. Oh. That's your eustachian tube letting air into your middle ear. When you're a little kid and you've got a lot of ear infections, that tube won't work real well. And you don't know to do the chew gum or open your mouth really wide to get it to, to pop. I am mean, just that's the ways that I've done it coming out of an airplane or an elevator. I mean, a kid wouldn't know how to do that. Right. And so it's it's hard because a lot of times they'll feel their ear pop or when you were little, if you felt your ear pop, you didn't really know what that meant, what that meant or why that happened or what does that mean? So putting a tube in the ear a lot of times is a good way to treat otitis media or ear infections. Um, there are other things as well, sometimes taking out adenoids, sometimes dealing with the sinus infections or sinus issues, whether it's whether it's evaluating their allergies or something else, mm-hmm. can be a real helpful means as well. You know, again, the head and neck, it's, it's a lot of complicated anatomy and it's a really small space. And we talked about the sinus is being connected. Well, you, the ear is connected to the back of the nose. And so they're all kind of connected. And so and when you're a child and or an adult, depending on how sick you are, all three of those. I mean, your ears can get congested, your nose can get congested, and, and you can get a sore throat as well. So it, it can be all related. You mentioned it being a small space in general for any human, but for little humans, that's an even smaller space. So does that complicate matters as well? It, well, the size of the ear canal can. The middle ear space, usually, I mean, as children grow, uh, obviously it's a lot better. When you're really small and you've got a small ear canal, it can make putting a tube in the ear difficult. We always use a microscope to do it. And typically, kid, we sedate kids when, they, when we have to put tubes in the ears. They have to go to the operating room to do that. In adults, if I had to ever, and I'm not trying to wish this on you, but <laughs> I appreciate that. if we ever had to put a tube in an adult's ear or, or your ear, what we would do, well, you're an adult, obviously, but if we had to put a tube in an adult's ear, a lot of times we're able to do that in the office. Oh. We can make a, put a little numbing medicine right on the eardrum, make a little incision in the eardrum, suck the fluid out and put the tube right there in the office. So we use different solutions for different problems. Are there any other primary issues that you see in children beyond tubes? We've talked a little bit about adenoids. Uh, do you want to talk any more about adenoids? Well, I guess the, the, really the thing is would be, you know, when you're, when you're coming to see the ENT doctor, what is the, what is the main problem? 
you know, a lot of times parents will come in and say, my kid can't breathe through their nose. Their nose is obstructed or they're snoring and their mouth breathing. And a lot of times it's their tonsils. Their tonsils mm-hmm. are real big. Their adenoids are real big. The, a lot of people ask, well, what? What are ad what are adenoids? Mm-hmm. So you've got a, a ring of lymphoid tissue in the back of your throat. And it's called Waldeyer's ring. And that refers to the the tonsils that you typically see when you look in your mouth. And then the adenoid tissue, which people hear about, but they don't really know where they are. It's in the back of the nose. And then you also have, have lingual tonsil tissue or tissue down there by the by the back of your tongue. So that's a whole ring. And that mm-hmm. lymphoid tissue serves a purpose. It, it makes antibodies. It's to help protect the, in, the, the individual's immune system. But when your tonsils get infected or chronically infected, we, they're not helping. We have to remove them. If the adenoids are consistently large, they can even serve as a reservoir, a bacterial reservoir uh, for ear infections. And so we'll take those out if we have to. I guess the question is, is really, what are you, what's the problem and how do you try, what can you offer someone if medical therapy is not working? A lot of times it's different medical therapy, whether or not that's to get them on allergy medicine or allergy testing. And sometimes in a lot of cases, it's surgical too. So much like we discussed with adults in some of our previous episodes, uh, if you go back to episodes uh, four and five in season one about sinus surgery, when and why, and when it's time to know, the same is true with children as far as the process and identifying that do you want to have a medical solution prior to a surgical solution? Yes. When you're talking about surgery in a child, I would say almost 100% of the time, but I'm sure there are some situations here that I'm, I'm, not, th- I'm not thinking of, but you're trying t- medical therapy first. Uh, there's no parent out there that's going to go, hey, you know, if there are two ways to fix something, I'd rather have the surgery than a medical option. Um, so, yeah, medical therapy comes first. A lot of times, though, by the time they get to the ear, nose, and throat doctor, they failed a lot of that. Right. Their pediatrician <clears throat> has probably attempted some of the medical therapies. The pediatrician, or care centers, family practice doctors, there's a whole lot of people out there treating families. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and when the it's not responding, that's when they start looking for an ENT doctor to try to help with some of these issues. Do you see, if you see one child in a family, you're likely to see multiple children in that family? Do, do these issues tend to, I mean, it, I know we've talked before about that it's environmental, it's genetic, it's biological, but does it tend to run in families? It can. That's really fun uh, point that you bring up because I do have families where I've seen uh, multiple siblings and so you get to know the whole family. It's, they're some of my favorite patients. But just because you take out tonsils and adenoids in one child doesn't mean you take tonsils and adenoids out in every child. Again, it kind of depends. But there have been days where <laughs> you take a group of siblings to the operating room. Um, mm-hmm. It happened with my own family as well. We took two of my children had had surgical procedures, and we elected to do that on the same day just because it was so much easier for the family dynamic. If one was going to go down, we'd rather deal with all of that at the, at the same right. time, more or less. Along those lines, when somebody is new, I, I'm a mom and I've been referred to you and, and I know I need to come see, how do I talk to my child about coming to an ENT doctor? It's going to be a different doctor than they're used to. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess it always depends on your child. I think the first thing would be you know, reassurance. Hey, you know, we're not going to do anything that's going to hurt, hurt you. Uh, you're not going to get a shot. I, I still remember going to the doctor and like, oh, my gosh, am I going to get a shot? <laughs> so no shots on the first visit. Uh, no shots usually for the most part. And the second thing is you got to tell them, look, you know, they, they may want to lay you down and look at your ears or look at your nose and your throat just because when children are smaller than adults, obviously, and trying to get them in the proper position to be able to examine them is difficult. And mm-hmm. sometimes you have to reposition them and lay them down to, to do that. We also talked a little bit about this in our first season, episode eight, the first appointment and what endoscopy is and nose TV. So you have a screen that can show people the insides of their nose. Do you ever show children the insides of their nose? I, yes. That's the first answer to the question. And it depends on the age of the child. Some kids are really interested and they want to know everything you're going to do and you know what's happening and some kids would rather not right. <laughs> would rather not see that, just like adults. Um, and it just depends on on the child and and how comfortable they are. Most of the time, we're seeing a child for the first time. We rarely will have to do an, an, an endoscopic procedure or an endoscopy at that visit. Now, there are some times when after you start talking to the parents about this is what you know, this is what I think we need. This is what I think we need to look at. We might choose to do an endoscopy at that time, depending on. Uh, what's going on. You know, one of the few examples I can think of right off the top of my head would be, you know, foreign body in the nose, Mm. uh, which, you know, adults, we don't think about that uh, for the most part. But children can 
put stuff up their nose at the drop of a hat. <laughs> I have some older kids now that we laugh about some of the stuff they put up their nose over the years. Um, oh, come on, you got to give us a couple of examples. Well, I'll, the one I'll tell you was a spaghetti noodle, uh, uh, which cooked or um, not cooked, not cooked, but you know if you stick it up there long enough, it gets cooked. <laughs> Most of the time, something like that, you know, it's an organic material and it would would kind of dissolve on its own. But nevertheless, it was kind of in there and it was causing an issue and it needed to come out. That sounds so sharp. It did when it went in and it had some bleeding, um, but we was it was one of the things we could get out. One of the most complicated ones, I'll just tell you if we've got a minute here, were magnets. Oh my. Somebody was playing with magnets and they got magnets on one side of the nose and the other side yeah. of the nose. And so they actually connect were, were like attracted stuck to each other. inside the nose, way back inside the nose. And every time I reached in to grab one, the other one was putting pressure on it. And these, they're metal, right? right? So I've got a hemostat trying to take this out. Well, it was causing a lot of pain. And wow. so we weren't it wasn't going to happen in the office. So we had to go to the operating room for that one. Um, so just, you know, something like that that you wouldn't normally think of um, that can happen pretty quick. And obviously there are other things that can go up the nose as well. But uh, those are the two of the vivid examples. Those are the fun examples of kids. Right. With kids. <laughs> right. Uh, I do have one more question before we wrap up. Do you work with kids with special needs? Yes, of course. You know, they have ear, nose and throat issues like everybody else. There are a lot of challenges. A lot of times you have to you have a team approach, talking with mom and dad about, you know, certain things that may need to be done or may not be done and, and how to do it comfortably in, a, in an air in a way that's not going to traumatize the parent or the child. Mm -hmm. um, and so complicated situations, but parents and children really are, are very adaptable. And a lot of times you have to be flexible enough to change what you do depending on what everyone's needs are. Well, I think you said the key word, which is team approach when it comes to working with children in general, whether typical children or special needs children. It's 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 a family affair. It's a family affair. And a lot of times, especially with kids when they're sick, it's a team approach. I mean, I'll, I'll call their pediatrician uh, or their family doctor and say, you know, look, I need some help because there's some of this stuff that can't do on my own. And um, we have some great pediatricians and great family practice doctors in town here. So everyone's usually always willing to, to help uh, no matter what the situation. And sometimes, depending on the situation, we've got to go from an outpatient setting into an inpatient setting and, and the child will need to be admitted. But there, we have a lot of help and a lot of resources. Now, do you ever refer out from your office? That's a really good question. The answer is yes. Uh, sometimes these issues can be really complicated. And if we're dealing with something with an ear, nose, and throat issue, but we need some help from the primary care doctor as well, uh, we'll be the first ones to call them and say, hey, look, what do you think about this? Or what's your opinion on, on getting another doctor involved? Or um, in terms of even a medication chain, how do we want to dose this medication if the child's on several different other medications? So it really is kind of a team approach. That's great. So, Dr. Swain, tell us how uh, a listener can get an appointment with you. First way is to call. Um, the, the number is 251 Four seven zero eight eight two three, and I'm reminded to to mention this again because a lot of times people don't have a pen handy. It's two five one four seven zero eight eight two three. However, you know we are trying to branch out and do some web based appointments. The easy way to go is there's a Premier Medical website. I work at Premier Medical and can access appointments there. The uh, we do have some uh, web based appointments available through my website, which is swainsinusshow.com. That's swainsinusshow.com, and there's a drronswain.com. That's d r r o n swain s w a i n dot com. I always like <laughs> the talking to a person, so I know that the appointment is booked. But we are trying to branch out into the new internet age. That's great. I'm glad to see you doing that. You know, it's always good to talk to a human on the phone. But uh, there are times when you need to make appointments at midnight because you're multitasking. Right. <laughs> and so to do it online will be helpful for, I'm sure, some parents. Especially for, for same-day appointments. Sometimes if you've had a problem or something's come up rather urgently, um, and you're trying to get in and you need to get in that day, you know, it's always good to call my nurses. They, they man the phones for us for those reasons. That sounds great. Well, thank you, Dr. Swain. This has been another fabulous episode of the Swain Sinus Show. Thanks, Stacy. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Swain Sinus Show. Please subscribe to our show on iTunes, Overcast, and anywhere you download your favorite podcasts. Want to know more about Dr. Swain or to schedule a consultation or appointment? Visit SwainSinusShow.com or call his amazing nursing staff at 251-470-8823.
We would love to hear what you think about the show. Email us at drswain at drronswain.com. Again, thanks for listening. Breathe easy and have a great day. This show is brought to you in part by the fine physicians and friendly staff at Premier Medical Group in Mobile, Alabama. 